I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush, joined, as always, by Patrick Wyman and uh, Nate Diaz, Stockton motherfucker what 209. I just had to get that out of the way at the start of the podcast because uh, Stockton was representing this weekend. Uh, was that a good idea to start the show <laughs> with, uh, with a you-can't-say-that-on-cable-television swear word? I'm That's not okay. surprised, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you saw it coming. Um, oh, yeah. We oh, are going to yeah. talk about Nate Diaz, the man to beat Conor McGregor. Who would have expected it? Granted, uh, before we get into it, I have to give my respect to Conor McGregor. It was a risky fight he didn't have to take. But I also have to say, you kind of get the sense he took Nick Diaz because he felt he was the smallest risk of the bunch. And he didn't have to take a short notice fight, but he also could have taken somebody with a full training camp behind him. And boy, does that make it so much more satisfying to see Nate Diaz get it done. Because we said this last week, Pat, the more you watch MMA, the more you have to appreciate the Diaz brothers. They always feel like these amazing underdogs. They have just just ridiculous, gritty, fuck you attitude. That's three F words in the first uh, minute of the show. They just, you know, they just go on. We're exactly where we should be on our on our F bomb. <laughs> it is, if we're talking about a fight between Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor, yeah, like, we are exactly where we should be. I'm not going to apologize for it. <laughs> me neither. Me neither. Uh, you know, it, it, you just you got to root for Nate Diaz. Uh, you know, no matter how big of a Conor McGregor fan is, you have to appreciate the fact that he he went through, um, you know, fire and brimstone and got a fa- a fantastic win, um, and then you know, showed off. I think this fight more than anything, and maybe this is the first angle we can go for as we discuss it, because uh, I'll let you guys know before we jump in. We're basically going to be talking about this fight. We're going to talk about Misha Tate's incredible upset win over Holly Holm in the co-main event, and then we're going to answer some questions from you, hopefully, at the end of the show, if we still have time. So it's basically just these results. Hopefully you don't mind. If you're an MMA fan, I suspect you will not. And if you're not an MMA fan, I'm glad you're listening, but I am confused. (laughs) So... um, I think the first angle I want to hit here is that I think this fight, uh, and I already covered this in my my article on Bloody Elbow, but I think this fight really sets the it, it sets Nate apart from Nick because we always think of the Diaz brothers as a unit, right? They're always seen together. They have such similar personas. They share taunting styles. They're so very similar in so many ways. They're both volume fighters. They're both tough as nails. Um, They both have the same kind of mentality when it comes to fighting. But they're very different fighters stylistically. And I think Nate often gets lumped in with Nick. I think I mentioned this last week as well. But I think this fight really showed how different Nate is from Nick because it's not as if Connor uh, wouldn't have also struggled with Nick Diaz, but it would have been a very different style of fight. And if if Nick had won, it would he would have won it in a very different manner. Do you agree with that? I do. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that we and we did talk about last week that the fights where Nate has really found himself in trouble is when it seemed like he was trying to be Nick. Yes, and. He was not trying to be Nick in this fight. No. Um, he wasn't trying to push McGregor backwards. He was perfectly happy to exchange shots in the pocket with Con- with McGregor. Um, but most importantly, this fight showed off how good Nate Diaz's lead hand is. Like, yeah, yeah. this was something that we talked about before the fight. I mentioned this on the Sherdog Roundtable. I mentioned this in my, in my complete breakdown of the fight, that McGregor is a southpaw designed to fight orthodox fighters. He has beaten southpaw fighters before. Make no mistake about that. I mean, like, he, he melted Dustin Poirier, obviously. But... A lot of what McGregor does is designed to beat orthodox fighters. Like the inside angle uh, across the plane of the body punch that he used to knock out Jose Aldo, the punch that he used to knock out Ivan Buchinger, the punch that he hit on Dennis Seaver repeatedly that changed the complexion of that fight. That is the core of McGregor's game, and that is a shot that you hit, and that's a shot that you hit an orthodox fighter with. Yes. It's, a, it's a punch that the orthodox fighter is so much more vulnerable to. Um, and I think that by and large, that's true of a lot of McGregor's game. Like I think that that punch encapsulates 
what McGregor does well and why he's so lethal against fighters like Jose Aldo and Chad Mendez and, you know, uh, and basically shorter orthodox fighters are the kinds of guys that McGregor is designed to eat alive. Um, and Nate Diaz, a taller southpaw with a really fantastic lead hand. I think this is the first fight where I think we really appreciate how good Nate Diaz's jab and his right hook are. Like we've seen it before. We saw him against Michael Johnson. There's, there's a lot of things. Southpaw. There's a lot of technical ac- aspects of Nate Diaz's game that I want to celebrate in this episode. But the jab is absolutely one of them. Well, and the and the and the way that he worked the jab and the right hook together. Yeah. When McGregor thought that the jab was coming, the right hook slapped him upside the head. And and the actual the... slap. We, let, let us not forget the actual slap, which yeah, I don't think is a. Slap him in the face. I don't think is necessarily a bad tactic. I it might be better to just turn your fist over and connect with the back of the pointer knuckle, uh, casting punch style, uh, Russian hooks, Cuban hooks, however you you like to call them. But um, I prefer that to hitting with the inside of the digits and the thumb at long range. Well, but. You, know? you and I both know that the purpose of the the purpose of sla- of Nate Diaz slapping somebody upside the face is not not at sure. all to land a forceful shot. Sure, <laughs> it's but too... it's it's certainly better than like having to pretend that Junior Dos Santos is slapping left hook is like some kind of magical technique. It's a, just a bad hook, and if you're going to throw that, then be- rather than break your hand, uh, you know why not slap the dude in the face? It humiliates him too. I think it it does appear to be sometimes a reflex. Like it's not even just a deliberate taunt for them. They feel the distance isn't right for the hook, and so they slap the in the back of the head instead yeah oh i'm totally okay with it it's it's one of the it's one of the things that that sets them apart and i like it but Mm -hmm. yeah i mean that was the big that was my big takeaway or one of my big takeaways from this fight is in a in a southpaw southpaw matchup conor mcgregor is going to have some trouble up until the point when he gets his lead hand working better and it it did look better in this fight than it has in a while i think because he was forced to use it more but he's just not on the level of a guy like nate diaz when it comes to using his his lead hand effectively oh yeah and i think um i i a lot of people were reposting the puncher's path um i guess i i people think i look very prescient now but i don't think i got it 100 percent right i do think that mcgregor is maybe going down that path or has gone down that path i think it's likely fortunate for him that he lost now and still is young and has the opportunity to make the to learn the right things from this time will tell if he does or if he takes the george foreman route and then has to come back when he's 40 um <laughs> but uh you know, I, I think Mc, the thing is McGregor didn't uh, – McGregor's version of the puncher's path, if that is indeed what happened here, was not him turning into a sloppy fighter. It was him kind of forgetting his strategic uh, strong suits. It was him losing sight of what was the smartest way to fight because technically speaking, he looked pretty damn good in the beginning of this fight. His head movement was better than ever before very noticeably. Nate had a lot of trouble connecting cleanly on him in the first round of this fight uh, until he started to make adjustments. Nate, as the fight went on, started to faint a little bit. He started to aim his jab at McGregor's chest and throat. That's when he really started catching him in the second round so he could catch him even when he slipped his head. Um, And then finding the left hand based off of where he expected his head to be after he slipped the jab, which was a beautiful adjustment that led to the the first really uh, hurtful punch of Diaz's in round two. But McGregor's head movement was nice, um, and he was countering off of it very well. He was throwing combination punches very well. It was just that he seemed to be completely dedicated to the idea of getting Diaz out of there early. I don't know if he put so much pressure on himself with all the predictions, um, but I suspect that, uh, like any sane person, it's difficult to run through Chad Mendez and then knock out the pound-for-pound pound, top three number one greatest featherweight of all time with ease in 13 seconds and not come away from that thinking that nobody can stop you. And that did seem to be McGregor's mentality in the beginning of this fight. Yeah, I agree with that to an extent, but let me, let me bounce an alternative theory off you here, Connor. Does this fight prove the extent to which Connor McGregor is a fighter who prepares a lot of specific things for an opponent? Because Maybe I think a lot yes. of what he did here was designed to uh, was designed to catch a guy like Rafael Dos Anjos. And I think that all of his sparring in this camp had been with guys who were about Dos Anjos' size and that this opponent change really messed with a lot of the things that he had ready for a specific opponent. Sure, but it does still say that uh, um his first go-to then as an adaptation was to just try to run through Nate Diaz as quickly as possible. And it was a – do we worry? Because uh, I do think like the uppercuts, I guess the wheel kicks. I don't know why that's really a great tactic for, for Dos Anjos. But the uppercuts definitely seem like something you'd want to use against the wrestler, things like that. Um, 
My question is, is going forward, do we worry that once McGregor – because there's a clear point in this fight that we were both discussing before we began this episode where McGregor thinks he, he lands one clean shot. He feels that his energy is fading – um, as he's discussed many times in the aftermath of the bout, and he basically just sells out on a few final combos and throws away the last of his stamina, and then Diaz starts picking him apart, and McGregor is basically beaten a minute before the choke ever gets sunk in. Yeah, let me let me come back to the to the point I was making real quick because I'm not disputing that that any of that is that any of that is wrong. I just want to say I just want to make the point that it's possible that a lot of what he was doing was predicated on the idea of fighting a guy who was going to be coming after him aggressively the way that Rafael dos Anjos would, and that that screwed a little bit, that screwed some with his preparation. So, sure. Because, because yeah, he, the fact that McGregor had so much trouble with Diaz's reach, I think is a large part of what gassed him. The shots that he expected to land cleanly, mm -hmm. um, instead he ended up exploding forward through, and that that takes a lot of energy, whether you realize it or not. I, yeah, it's true. And I, I, I agree with you. And he did seem he was really, really focused on counterpunching in this fight. It was all aggressive counterpunching uh, for the most part, but he was really focused on pre on countering. Uh, you get the sense that he was working on those counter triggers a lot with Owen Roddy to uh, to sort of thwart Dos Anjos's pressure tactics. Um, but listening to McGregor in the aftermath of the fight, I think you also have to acknowledge that he he did not he did a part of his mind didn't accept the fact that it could not be a win. You know what I mean? Uh, he, he talked about how he hit McGregor or he hit Diaz with some punches. And even in the, in the aftermath, he was saying those were punches that would have crumbled other men, but it didn't crumble Diaz. And I was wasting my energy and he realized it, but he was still telling himself even after the fight, you know, those would have crumbled other men. So I, I just have to, I have to wonder if he's going to fix this going forward uh, he was talking about adapting and changing his tactics for bigger guys in the future. But I have to wonder if he goes back down and dominates a few more fights at featherweight, which is certainly possible. Uh, does he then come back up to lightweight and still just kind of have this feeling that he can blow you out of the water? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so to the extent that I'm with that, I think that there were a couple of different failures of fight IQ here for McGregor. So the so as far as his triggers were concerned, um McGregor allowed himself to get drawn into a fight at the Diaz brothers pace. Yes. So that was, so that was both a failure of game planning and it was a failure and it was an in-fight failure that he was unable to pull his pace back and adjust once it became clear that Diaz was drawing him into his pace of fight. It was the like, same kind of problem that Jose Aldo has had, except that McGregor doesn't have Jose Aldo's depth of experience to know like how to coast when his energy has gone and how to slowly let it come back. Once it was gone, it was gone. Well, and he may just not have those instincts. Do you think it's possible, Connor, that that McGregor is inherently a front runner? Maybe that's the thing. He's been such a good looking front runner. He hasn't looked like a a guy who needs to blow it out of the water. He's even gone two rounds with the several guys and had he's had some difficult fights. But I think he has always felt that his punches were having an effect. I think he's always felt that he could cause a momentum swing when he connected. And because uh, even early in the Mendez fight, he was getting a response out of Mendez with his shots. He hurt him with a kick to the body relatively early in that fight. He backed him off with the left hand. He came after him and got countered, but he saw that there was a response there. And Diaz was like a poker face all the way through this bout. He ate some clean shots, too. I think we have to, to discuss in a bit how difficult he was to hit cleanly, but the shots that landed clean were some thunderous blows, particularly whenever McGregor was countering his jab, the cross counter with the left hand over the top. Mm -hmm. Diaz was just running his face into those shots, and he was getting eaten up by him whenever they landed, and he just didn't react. And you have to wonder the impact of that. Like that, if you are a front runner, that's going to hurt. You know, that's going to that's gonna hurt you mentally to see that in your opponent. Yeah, because think about the the parallel that we use a lot to talk about front runners is Anthony Johnson. Because it's not sure. like Anthony Johnson can't fight three rounds, as we saw when he fought Phil Davis, when he yeah. fought Andre Arlovski. If he's in control, he looks great. Yeah, he was in control of both those fights. And maybe there's an extent to which, if you're a front runner, you can fight for as long as you want to, as long as you feel like you're winning the fight. And if you're McGregor and Diaz has taken your Sunday best punches, you've busted up the right side of his face. Like, uh, like one thing here. We talk about Nate Diaz getting busted up, sure. What McGregor did to the with his left hand to the right oh, side God. of Diaz's face 
is something special, even in the annals of Diaz brothers getting busted <laughs> you, you've up. You've seen like, the, the Fox Sports 1 interview after Diaz has his stitches, his right eye is swollen. There's like nine four-inch long slashes across his cheek and jaw and neck. The left, the right side of his face and the left side of his face is fine. But the left, right side of his face where he was getting hit by McGregor's left hand is destroyed. He looks like yeah. Two-Face. Yeah, so I don't think I think we can put to rest any any real problems, any real questions we have about Will McGregor's power translate. What he did to Nate Diaz's face suggests that his power does move up with him. It's that Nate Diaz is an incredibly tough dude, and uh, and and his poker face enough to not let you know when you've hurt him, and a shockingly crafty one. I think he is more difficult to hurt than even a lot of other lightweights would be. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so uh, so I just wanted to get that out of the way real quick because McGregor did hurt him. He just didn't hurt him enough to make him feel like he was like he was in control of the fight. And there was a distinct point at which the low kicks really more or less disappeared, like mm-hmm. which he had been using early on to frustrate Diaz and land some shots. The body shots disappeared. He had McGregor one pretty nasty last... oblique kick that he landed or a side kick to the knee that was like uh, Miguel Torres-esque or, or the Keith Jardine, Brandon Vera kick. It did not look good. Yeah. So but he gave up. He more or less gave up on those in the second round. Yeah. Um, and he he threw his last body punch at four tw- at, at the four twenty mark of the second round. He did not throw another body punch after that. I and... think there are a couple reasons for that. Can I can I can I say? Yeah, it? sure. Get in. Well, I think one um, is that of course McGregor got. He got sucked into a boxing match. I think like Jose Aldo, I think he is probably a very tactically minded fighter. And he saw the openings in the boxing. He saw that he had someone trying to box him. And so his mind focused entirely on solving that problem with his boxing. Uh, But I think really I have to give some credit to Nate Diaz's kicking. Because just like in the Michael Johnson fight, his kicking game was much more present than it used to be in the past. And he's never going to be amazing at checking kicks. His stance just doesn't allow for it. He did better at it in the Johnson fight. Um, but like in that fight, he was throwing off a lot of kicks from the lead leg, a lot of little stepping kicks, a lot of, uh, side kicks, front kicks and teeps, um, long outside low kicks, things like that. And the, what I really like about that for Nate Diaz is they're, they're not powerful kicks. Um, in the same way that Nate or Nick often throws like off awkward slapping kicks. Uh, Nick, you get the sense does it just to like make you look like a moron for 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 stepping back from this silly ass karate kick. For Nate though, I think it has a real tactical strength because most fighters they try to counter punches with kicks. Uh, this is like old school Dutch Muay Thai teaching. They will step in. Uh, if you come from a kickboxing background, you'll step in with your head off line and counter a punch with a kick. If somebody is throwing kicks at you, you will catch or step into the kick and counter it with a punch. And for Nate Diaz with his frame, adding more kicks in, mixing his jab with kicks is beautiful because opponents counter him with kicks a lot. When he steps in with his jab, he leaves his front leg out there, puts a lot of weight on it. He gets countered with kicks. But when he starts kicking, they find it really difficult to counter him with punches. I don't think McGregor had almost any success coming through with that left hand after Diaz kicked him with the right leg, and he tried it a lot. But I think he felt like he had to close the distance with his punches because Diaz was putting that teep in his body. He landed a couple really nice front kicks to the body, was doing just tapping little kicks to his leg, and that kind of hides the motion, the hip motion of the jab as well. So you have two things to worry about, and both of them are, are more easily countered with kick uh, with punches than with kicks. And that feeds into Nate's reach advantage yeah the sequence that leads directly into the the hard one two that rocks mcgregor um begins with diaz backing mcgregor yes. off with a front kick to the body yes and like, then he throws a jab so, he sees mcgregor slip and then ultimately when he hurts him it's because he he predicts the same exact slip and catches him on the way back up yeah that whole sequence starts because of a it starts because of a diaz front kick like that's which is amazing because yeah like to me one of the big major takeaways from this fight is, and this sounds a little bit like a cliche, but but it bears remembering the height and reach matter. Oh like, yeah, they matter a lot, and there are a few fighters in uh, in all of MMA who do a better job of using every inch of their height than Nate Diaz, and like it's no uh, that contributed to McGregor tiring. When you have to explode through another few inches of space, uh, when you're swinging and missing more than you're used to, like McGregor is normally a very accurate puncher. He missed on a lot more punches than we're used to seeing from him tonight, like or on on Saturday night. When you miss on a lot of punches, when you're swinging and missing, when you've got more ground to cover, that takes away from your gas tank. 
McGregor is used to being the longer guy and being able to move efficiently. He was not able to move efficiently here because of the kind of because of the kind of of distance Diaz was able to set over the course of the fight. Yeah, I honestly can't think of any fighters in MMA that are patently better outfighters than Nate Diaz. And he certainly has tactical holes in his game. He's still open to the kicks and things like that. But when it comes to long range boxing, I don't think there's anyone who does it better in this sport. Hmm. I, I mean, there's Alexander better. Gustafson, and I don't think he's as cool under pressure. I don't think he's as good defensively, and I don't think his footwork is as good on the back foot. He's nowhere near as good a counterpuncher. No, not nearly. And there's John Jones, but honestly, John Jones's long range tactics are often kind of rudimentary, uh, with the like extended forearm and just kind of stepping away. Nobody catches opponents coming in. Nobody pulls away from punches. Nobody plays with a sense of distance and sets up counters, uh, and then ultimately takes over the fight from long distance like Nate Diaz. Steven Thompson. Oh, that's true. Steven Thompson's a, a very good one. That's a very yeah, good how, one. How weird is it that one of the closest parallels for the kind of game that Nate Diaz wants to play is Steven Wonderboy Thompson? I would love to see those two fight, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, but like, I mean, so, so let's explore this real quick. It's weird that both Diaz and Thompson like to set a nice long distance for you. Um, Thompson uses sidekicks to do that. Diaz uses the jab to do that. But then the real meat of their game is beating the crap out of you as you come in. And then, and then once you get back to long range and you feel like you can't get inside anymore, then they're going to tap, tap, tap away with shots at, with shots at that, at that long distance. So both both guys are outside are pure outside fighters in the sense that they want to set a long distance for you and give you hell as you try to come in on them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to I want to talk more about this. I, we, I have so much more to say about this. That I didn't get to talk about in my article. I want to talk about the finishing sequence. Uh, I want to talk more about the implications of McGregor going forward. And I want to talk about Nate Diaz's footwork. It's gotten a bad rap and it was on display in this fight. And I want to discuss that. So why don't we take a break? And when we come back, we will delve into all of those topics and more. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And we are back. So the last thing I mentioned is the first thing I want to discuss here. Let's talk about Nate Diaz's footwork. We, uh, we already mentioned earlier, Pat, how when Nate has tried to be Nick, his footwork has looked bad. And I think he has gotten a reputation as a fighter who just doesn't have good footwork. And I don't think that's true. I think there are limitations to the ways in which he can use his footwork. I think he's probably a lot like um, uh, Joe Lewis, for example. Joe Lewis is the easiest example. Joe Lewis, as a boxer, was always thought of as a guy who people always said he was a bad. He had bad footwork. He wasn't a good mover because he wasn't good at cutting off the ring. But when it came to moving around his opponent and discovering angles of attack, he was very good. Uh, Roman Gonzalez is often the same way. He's very comparable to Joe Lewis in a lot of ways. Um, Not great. Doesn't have great awareness uh, of keeping the back to the ring. But it's almost like these fighters are more focused on navigating the angles of their opponent's body than they are in navigating the ring. And I think that's Nate Diaz. Because if, if we look at this fight... He wasn't trying to cut off the ring, so we didn't get to notice how bad he might have, badly he might have done that. Instead, he was purely focused on creating angles to escape McGregor's power or to nullify it or to counter him or all three of those at the same time. And um, he did such a good job of it. And I don't think I've ever noticed so strongly. I mean, I picked up on it when I was researching for this fight, when I watched the Johnson fight, when I watched the Cerrone fight and the Gallard fight, which is quite similar to this. But I don't think I've ever noticed so strongly how good Nate Diaz is at not pulling back in straight lines. Anytime he pulls away from a punch, he almost always creates at least a small angle moving his back foot. And if he doesn't do it, then he will then move in to smother your further punches and then create an angle to escape. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say exactly the same thing that when Nate takes a step back, it is almost always accompanied by a very slight pivot. Yeah. They're not big pivots. He's not taking big 45 degree angles, but it's small. It's like 15, 20 degrees, yeah. but it's every time he takes a step and he takes a lot of very small steps. 
So you don't notice it, but if you're but if you're trying to back Nate Diaz up to the fence, as Conor McGregor was for long portions of this fight, he's surprisingly hard to put there because you're if you don't really realize it, he's moving like a, like the second hand around a clock pretty much every time you come at him. Yeah. And and there's a lot of I mean there's just a lot of depth to Nate's footwork that I don't think really had the opportunity to be noticed or we just weren't picking up on it until now like um when Nate wants to come forward he will fight out of a pretty narrow stance so then he can then widen his stance as he covers distance but when he's anticipating you to attack when he's waiting on a counter and when he's just kind of prodding away and seeing what you're going to do he will keep his back foot out far behind him even to the point where he'll come forward see that you're waiting to, to lead or you're looking for an opening and he'll drop his back foot back. Uh, and he did this to McGregor a lot and he would look, his stance would look no different from McGregor's view, not noticeably anyway, but his back foot would be about two feet behind him rather than directly under his body. Not a great offensive position, but then when McGregor would lead with the left hand, Nate had all of this room to cover in pulling his head back. And he would even add an additional step in, but because his back foot was so far behind him, he could load back onto it like a spring, absorb whatever impact McGregor was giving him, uh, or completely avoid the punch altogether, and then look for an opportunity to counter. Often um, pulling his way back, he drags that right hook back with him. But just all these little preparatory steps and adjustments... Um, and I was so impressed with how uh, cognizant Nate was of these little positional things, even under duress. Because McGregor, as we said, he landed some big shots. But even when he was landing these shots, Nate was still retreating on angles. He showed great discipline. And that's not something like that. I think that may be the Diaz brother trait, it, whether it's because of their fitness, their endurance, stamina. Um, I've made the mistake of calling them not great athletes. Um, because I don't think of them as like innately explosive guys. I think their athleticism uh, comes from a great deal of hard work because they're both such endurance, uh, endurance triathlon, bicycling, swimming, running, all those things. Like, I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick with this and, and and disagree. The Diaz brothers are not athletic. Like endurance is not athleticism in the sense that we talk about it. Unless MMA wants to adopt a definition of athleticism that varies drastically yeah. from every single other there, sport out there, the Diaz brothers are not athletic. There's kind like, of the, there's kind of the layman's term where, where then, which is the way I tend to use it, where it's like, when I say athletic, I mean someone who has a lot of fast twitch muscle abilities. That, but that's They're, not even the layman's, that's not even the layman's definition. That is the definition of athleticism that you see used in absolutely every single other sport. Yeah. Proprioception, hand-eye coordination, explosiveness, fast Fast twitch, that is what athleticism is in a sporting context. Like we can talk about endur we can talk about endurance as a component of a MMA specific set of physical tools, but that is not athleticism. Like I'm like I'm really tired of having this discussion every time I use the term with some dumbass fan in the comments who's like, Well, the Diaz brothers are athletic, Bisping's athletic because they they're they've got a lot of endurance. That's not athleticism as it's understood. So unless we want to rewrite the semantic value of that term. And if you're, if you want to do that, go ahead, but I'm not going to be the one. To do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with expanding the definition. I'm okay with saying that in certain contexts, athletic can just mean someone who is good at a sport. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a vague definition from where I stand. Well, then, then why don't we just say that they're good at that sport? Like, why would we yeah. use the term athletic? Yeah. yeah like yeah. I, I athletic see means like the Diaz brothers are not going to go out there and, and dunk a basketball anytime soon. No, like, no, there. And that's the idea is you could take somebody like 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 Spud Webb was athletic because he was five foot three and he had crazy fast twitch explosiveness. Like that's I don't know. And I think I, I, I think this reaction a lot because I got it, too. And I said, oh, OK, I should have defined it better. And, and that's fine. Uh, but I think a lot of the react the negative reaction you get when you use that term is because people think it's like an insult. And, and even when I say it, it may sound like a backhanded compliment at best. But I say it to point out how impressed I am with the skills of these fighters. Like when I say that Donald Cerrone is not a phenomenal athlete or that Diaz brothers are not phenomenal athletes or that um, – I don't know who else is there in MMA. Uh, I mean, I think Bisping is not a phenomenal Bisping. athlete. Bisping is a great example. If I say Bisping is not a phenomenal athlete, I'm not saying that these guys aren't good. I'm saying that you you put Bisping next to Yoel Romero, and you have very obvious differences. Or even next to a guy like Jacare or Rockhold or Weidman, anybody else at the top of the division, even next to Bisping, uh, next to Silva, I mean, Anderson Silva. And you put Nate, Nate Diaz next to Conor McGregor or Anthony Pettis, or even Rafael dos Anjos, these guys who have 
uh, whether through work or through natural ability, that kind of ridiculous explosive, that ability to cover distance and a sudden movement, that ability to generate tremendous force in very short distances, they don't have that. And because they don't have that, their styles become all the more impressive. It's all hard work. It is all discipline, technical discipline, often under duress. And the the thing that I, that I love most about this fight is that I think it illustrates uh, the way that experience and physical limitations can have a profound and important effect on a fighter's mentality. Because I think uh, I think McGregor and Nate Diaz have pretty similar mentalities in terms well, I, of. It should, I think it should tell us that athleticism, as the term is understood, is not what makes or breaks a good a, a good fight. No, yeah, like. That if it were, Alex Garcia would be a top five welterweight, and he's not. The guy, like, the shit just does not fall together for him in the way that it does for right. a lot of other guys. Like, now it's, I think it's hard to be one of the, one of the best fighters on the face of the planet. Like, if you look at a pound for pound list, I think it's really hard to be one of those guys if you don't have great athletic tools married to everything else, you need to be a great fighter, but you can be a great fighter without having crazy fast twitch, uh, twitch muscles. If you do the kinds of things that the Diaz brothers do with endurance and with length, like I think it would be really hard to be short and muscular in a division and try and fight the way that the Diaz brothers do. Like, you know, it takes everything that they have, the combination of their mentality, their frames, their uh, their in fight adjustments, their uh, like their fight IQ, the ability to just not give a fuck, yeah. which is a really important thing in a fight. Like, I, I because... think honestly, the Diaz brothers have the fighters mentality because mm-hmm. the D- the Diaz brothers. I thought of this right after the fight. I said this to uh, to to my girlfriend, to Brittany, uh, after the bout. I was like, man, the Diaz brothers are perfect fighters in, in the mind because when they lose, it's utter bullshit. And they don't believe it. And they're like, no way. There's corruption. The other guy's on steroids. Uh, the judges went against me. I won that fight. I won that fight. And when they win, they're not surprised, motherfucker. They saw it coming all along. So, like, they have this perfect mentality. But unlike Conor McGregor, they don't have this ridiculous athleticism. So every fight, even when they win, almost every fight, I should say, is still something of a struggle. They still know how hard they have to work to improve and to be in shape for each and every fight. And they know that going into a fight, they're going to win. Of course they're going to win. But they know that they're going to need their discipline. They're going to need to stay calm. They're going to need to be patient. Um, and that's I, that was like such a strong contrast between these two guys because they both have this fuck you attitude, McGregor and Diaz. But McGregor, in terms of athletic talents, I think he has a lot of things on a platter. A lot of things come really easily to him. The speed with which he's picked up these ridiculous spinning kicks – um, and the head movement from Owen Roddy, who he's not been working with that long, he picks things up really quickly. They come so easily to him. Nate Diaz, it's been a long, hard road against very tough opposition. It, it feels more earned almost, but it's also like Nate is a better fighter because of how difficult his road has been. Conor McGregor hasn't been blessed with that difficult a road. Things have been so easy for him that he hasn't been able to temper his confidence, um, he hasn't been able to keep it from turning into hubris, you know, Some, somebody who believes in the law of attraction. I, I don't think Nate Diaz believes in the law of attraction. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, Nate Diaz like, believes in conspiracy theories. The opposite of the law of attraction. Nate Diaz yeah. believes that if you don't go out and work for shit, it won't happen. Yeah. I mean, I like I, I think the law of attraction is total bullshit, but it makes total sense if you're if you're Conor McGregor right. to believe that because like, things come easily. Yeah. But but so. With As far as McGregor's concerned, I think – and I'm going to write an article about this later this week. But I think he needs to make a choice at this point. Does he want to be an all-time great fighter, period, or does he want to be an all-time great action fighter? Because he could keep doing the things that he's doing and keep working on the things that he's working on right now. And I think he could be an all-time great action fighter. Mm-hmm. Like I think like nobody is going to look at the fight that he had with Nate Diaz and say, you know what? I didn't get my money's worth out of that. Oh, hell no. Like, and he's and here's the thing. He's going to get rich either way. He's going to be the best paid fighter in the history of mixed martial arts it is probably already close to that point right now after only a few big pay-per-views. Nope. Nobody's like, going to look at any McGregor fight and feel like they didn't get their money worth unless it's the Aldo one because they expected more than 13 seconds. And you can't fault him for that. He did his yeah. job too well. Yeah. So so my thing is, 
if he just wants to be a money weight fighter and chase entertaining fights with guys like Donald Cerrone and Anthony Pettis and all of that, and then like basically be a better paid version of Donald Cerrone who bounces between 145 and 170, depending on where the money fights are at. Like, I think he can do that and just keep working on the things that he's working on right now, like his pocket boxing and all of that good stuff. And I think he'll be fine. But if he wants to be the greatest fighter, if he wants to be one of the great fighters out there, period, he's got some shoring up to do of his, of his takedown defense and his defensive grappling. Like I'm not going to get on him that hard for what happened at the end of the fight because he was rocked and he was exhausted and all of that. But like getting taken down by Nate Diaz off that single leg in the first, like, what do you think? Like he wasn't going to sweep Rafael Dos Anjos from that position. That's for goddamn sure. Yeah, probably like, not. I mean, his reaction with the sweep was really nice. He went right to the. It was some real Faraz Zahabi shit. Faraz would have been proud. The foot lock to the, to the sweep to top position, but it was not something I would rely on as a defensive tactic against a guy like RDA. Yeah, I'm saying like if he if he goes in there against a much more dedicated and skilled takedown artist and tries shit like that repeatedly against a guy with that kind of top game and that kind of yeah. and that kind of cage wrestling skills like he would have gotten the crap beat out of him regardless of what he had learned with his pocket boxing and having like, having dos Anjos on top of you is a whole hell of a lot worse than having chad mendez on top of you or ha- or or even worse than having nate diaz on top of you if we're oh, being yeah. honest about it but definitely like, dos Anjos is a is a is a punishing top position fighter and and, and more so, likely to stay there you know so like if we're looking at within this sample things to worry about for mcgregor as he as he turns into a uh, if we're talking about him as an all-time great fighter, like he also needs to learn to control his pace. Yes. Like, and he needs to learn. He needs to learn to fight a little bit more disciplined because he could have gone out there and fought at a pace where he was throwing between twelve and fifteen strikes a minute. And I think his gas tank would have lasted fine. But he let himself get drawn into Nate Diaz's fight. He gave up on his kicks. He gave up on his body shots. He gave up on working the legs, and because he thought that he could get him out of there. And you can't fight a Diaz brother the way that McGregor fought Nate Diaz and and expect to consistently win that fight. Maybe he doesn't care. It's entirely possible that he is that he is so invested in the idea of being exciting and making money off of being exciting that 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 none of that stuff matters. And if so, more power to him. I, I'm totally okay with I that. I suspect but, he wants a legacy though. I suspect he wants to to prove himself as an all-time great. Well, well, and I suspect he wants to walk away without CTE when his career is over. Yes. You know, I, I, I don't think, think so. he wants to be the guy who's getting hit in the head. I think Diaz hit him 65 times in the face over the course the, of that fight. The head movement he added is a nice touch, but if you're going to exhaust yourself in every fight and um, and, and, and ultimately make yourself an easy target and a, and a more hurtable target, then it's still not going to – you know, the pace, the pace and the distance, those play into how easy you are to hit just as much as your defense. Yeah, You've got exactly. to be able to control that. Because even guys like – like if we look at like Pernell Whitaker, Pernell Whitaker could stand inside and control the pace. He could stand inside the pocket. He could clinch. He could – Make you miss, make you swing, hit his gloves, conserve his energy, or get his energy back if he was tired, and he could recover. Robbie Lawler can do that. Robbie Lawler can get hurt, badly stunned, and then use your flurry as a chance to recover and then donk you with a big counter before the round ends. Um, Conor McGregor hasn't learned that yet. So I, I still have... I still have hope that he can learn that. He was saying a lot of wise things after this fight. He was talking about how uh, in future he's going to go down to 145, but in future when he goes for lightweight again, he's got to adjust for the bigger guys. Uh, he's got to adjust how much how he approaches them and, and how he, he, he sets up his, his attempts to cover the distance. But it's going to take more experience, and it's going to take more tough fights. And I don't know if he can learn that if he goes to featherweight and has some more dominant performances. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting road he's going to walk. Um, by the way, for all the people saying that McGregor's brand is dead or that the hype train is derailed, every one of you people will be watching his next fight. It's, yeah. it, it, the story only got more interesting. You know, it's Now can we see if McGregor can come back from adversity? It's more fascinating than it was before. Yeah, be, like this is the, the joy of Conor McGregor. This is something that Paul Heyman said to me when I was when I was writing a story about how the UFC has built McGregor and Rousey, that McGregor is in the, is there are more preset narratives that you can use to sell Ronda Rousey. Um, but that over time, McGregor is the more valuable commodity because of the way that he can generate new narratives almost at will. Yeah. Like that he is never at a loss for ways to sell a fight to you. And to the extent that even when his career is over, we talked about this on beat down after the bell with TJ DeSantis on Saturday night, like 
even after he's done as a fighter, McGregor is going to be McGregor. Dana White had better look out because McGregor is going to be an all time great promoter of fights, even if he's not yeah. promoting himself. Everything about McGregor, you have to have an opinion on McGregor. That is the magic of Conor McGregor, much like Floyd Mayweather. If you're an MMA fan or you know of MMA or even if you don't really know of MMA, you pretty much have to have an opinion. You hear one one soundbite. You're like, oh, I hate this guy or this guy's awesome. And even when he loses, like – Nobody else generates this many spiteful memes when they lose. You know what I mean? Maybe Ronda Rousey. But all the memes of McGregor in a photoshopped – his head photoshopped on a little kid's body in Sunday morning jiu-jitsu class with Nate Diaz as the teacher. Like those, the, that, that still generates a storyline going forward because of all the trash talk beforehand, even when it backfires. It makes it more interesting. So I'm, I'm fascinated to see. Can we talk a little bit before we wrap this segment up about the finishing sequence? Because we, we don't give as much love to uh, grappling as we should sometimes on this show. And this was some beautiful goddamn jiu-jitsu from Nate Diaz. Oh, yeah. End of this Absolutely. Fight. Let's go for it. Uh, well, first of all, uh, oh, you're a wrestler now is the funniest post-fight thought I've ever heard. <laughs> Nate Diaz said he hit Conor McGregor with a knee. He heard him go, ugh. And then he shot for a takedown. And Nate's thought was, oh, you're a wrestler now? Because um, <laughs> I'm the one with the black belt in jiu-jitsu. So Nate goes for this. His sprawl was really nice, but he used it as an opportunity to, to grab McGregor's neck. And because McGregor was trying to pass to half guard, I loved this. McGregor tries to pass to half guard when Diaz falls to his back. And because he doesn't have his legs in position for guard, Diaz kind of gets a leg trap in there, like an inside butterfly hook to prevent McGregor from getting full side control. And while McGregor is trying to free his legs, he releases his arm in guillotine grip and switches to a prayer choke. The McKenzie team, the Marcelo team, um, or is a Marcelo team a high elbow guillotine? I don't know. That's the, that's the Marcelo team. Okay. The prayer choke. He switches to that and McGregor feels it come on tight because Nate Diaz, um, like Ben Henderson has one of those guillotines where he can finish it without the leg position. He can put the grip on your neck so tight by adjusting the position of his hands. And so McGregor had to fall to his back. Um, just like he did in the Chad Mendes fight. But unlike Chad Mendes, uh, Nate was not looking to use this as an opportunity to escape the ground or to reset. He was looking to control. So the moment he rolls to his back, Nate gets this super tight top side control, keeps McGregor turned away from him, and just has the easiest mount pass of all time. I think the moment he escaped from that guillotine choke, it was the last bit of energy that McGregor had left in his body to try to escape or survive. Is pretty much done after that. But I just loved how effortlessly Nate transitioned from the sprawl to the guillotine, changed grips, stopped the side control pass to keep the choke a threat, and then used the choke with that leg block, that inside butterfly hook, to sweep McGregor over to his back and take him out. It was just... Did you like the way he fainted for an arm bar when he took him out? Like he used oh, the I didn't notice of, that. He used the threat of... Yeah, so if, so if you go back and look at this here... As he's uh, as he's in side control, he f he grabs McGregor's arm like he's looking to set up an arm bar and uses the th and as McGregor looks to uh, looks to uh, go to like a hitchhiker escape, looks to start a hitchhiker escape. That's when he rolls. That's when he slides the knee over and gets into mount. Oh, really I see that. He he almost looks like he's passing to S mount, like and threatening the arm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, so he's so he's right here. He's got it. He's got the his grip on the arm laced up. He looks like he's setting up to to swing his to swing his left leg over the head, and then when McGregor looks to start defending that, he swings himself over into mount. And then a like, final a final Stockton slap to the mug before sinking in the choke. I just love this fight, man. I've watched this fight so many times, and it has not gotten less enjoyable. It was uh, I said this after the Rousey fight, but sometimes you are just so happy to have been wrong about something. It's so fun to be surprised and to be so utterly shocked. Well, but you, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say that. I'm going to go ahead and say this. We were we should not have been that surprised at this outcome, like yeah maybe not. sometimes because we we talked about this on our show last week that there was an easy way, like there was an easy path to victory in our heads in this for Nate Diaz. Yeah, stick the shorter fighter on the outside behind uh, behind your long rangy sh rangy shots, and if you hurt him, immediately hop it immediately hop into grappling like. That this was that it was a simple, straightforward path. To Some, someone even said to us on Twitter, "You guys said all the ways that that uh, Nate Diaz could and did win, 
but chickened out and picked McGregor. <laughs> it's so yeah. hard sometimes to pick against the momentum of the champ, you know, or of the momentum of the pound for pound top fighter. Like, even though he was a much bigger underdog in this fight, I thought Nate Diaz's path to victory was much clearer than Misha Tate's was. Oh, sure. Against Holly yeah. Holm. Like, yeah. I, like, I rated the chances of Diaz, of a Diaz win much higher than I rated, uh, much higher than I rated Tate's. Hmm. Man, what a fight. Great fight. Fantastic fight. I'm so, the aftermath is amazing. Excited to see where McGregor goes. I don't care where Nate Diaz goes. Like, I'm just excited to watch him fight. I don't care what kind of matchup he ends up in. Ends up in, I would love to see him get some rematches against some top fighters and sh- put in better performances. Um, but man, like, uh, this is a legacy, f- a legacy win for Nate Diaz. One of the greatest wins either of the Diaz brothers has ever gotten. And uh, well deserved. Absolutely well deserved. So, biggest win either of the Diaz brothers have ever gotten, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I, that's what I mean. I think it was it was the the most uh, monumentous, you know, the most uh, momentous, the most uh, high profile I mean, win either of them's gotten. Because the other one would be Nick versus Gomi, right? Probably, yeah. <laughs> Both of these guys' fights against Gomi were awesome, by the way. Oh yeah, I rewatched that Nate Diaz fight with Gomi. Ooh. That was killer. Mm. That, <laughs> that was a beatdown. Uh, okay, well, that wraps up this fight. I could I could talk about it all day. There's just a million things to discuss, and it, it's such a fun fight to rewatch. If you guys haven't yet, I encourage you to rewatch this one. Keep an eye out for how Nate um, moves with the punches early on. Keep an eye on how McGregor starts to maybe move away from his game plan and move away from certain areas of attack and focusing on and bombing with headshots. Keep an eye on the finishing sequence. Uh, keep an eye on the change in Nate Diaz's body language when he feels the power go down, go out of Conor McGregor's punches. So many little tiny moments that are such a pleasure to pick up on. Just a pleasure to watch. So bravo to you, Nate Diaz, Conor McGregor. We're looking forward to seeing you back in action and seeing where you can go from this. When we come back from this next break, we are going to talk about Misha Tate, the new women's bantamweight champion, and her incredible upset win over Holly Holm in the co-main event after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve, so thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And we are back, as I said, in our final segment. We want to talk about Misha Tate and Holly Holm. Pat, I'll let you take the lead on this one. What are your overall thoughts on the fight? Well, so a a few different things stood out to me uh, about, about what Misha Tate did. Uh, but first of all, I, I think this needs to be stated. This was, I would say, the highest level fight in terms of in-fight adjustments and fight IQ that we've ever seen at women's bantamweight and maybe in women's MMA period. Um, the, this involved a great deal of back and forth and a great deal of adjusting from two smart fighters and well-trained fighters mm-hmm. who had who were getting great corner advice over the course of the fight. So early on um, – uh, Greg Jackson and Mike Wicklenjohn picked up in Holmes' corner that Tate was looking to counter every time Holm came in. She was looking to counter with punches. So, uh, so their response to that was to get Holm angling off, uh, and that's exactly what Holm did in her first combination of the second round. Tate's response to that was instead of looking to counter with punches, she started countering with level changes, and that's how she got Holm down early on in that round. Then Holm adjusted to that adjusted to that adjustment in the third and fourth rounds and was able to mostly stick Holm. It was mostly able to stick Tate at distance, and then finally in the fifth round, Tate responded by measuring distance as Holm came in with her jab, and she was able to slide herself just close enough to counter Holmes' last blitz, that last left hand with a level change and a, take, and a trip takedown. Mm-hmm. There was like, certainly certainly some good fortune there for Misha Tate in that last round, I think. But I think also just the fact that she was getting good advice and that she was keyed in to the idea that she needed to take this round in order to win the fight. So she was super aware, ultra aware of of the openings that she needed to attack and and we've said this many times in the past we 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 cannot say enough how good Misha Tate is at pushing when she knows she needs to push withstanding punishment um early in the fight and adapting and and seizing on openings as they appear over the course of a bout 
what she never gave up on the basic idea that she was going for. The basic idea that she was trying to hit was to counter Holmes uh, to counter Holmes' offense with her own offense. This was what she yeah. was looking to do both with strikes and with takedowns through the entire fight. Why? Because Holmes is bigger, longer, uh, more athletic, faster, all of these things. So for so for and she for didn't to, she didn't want to be Ronda Rousey. She didn't want to be running yeah. into Holmes' left over and over. Exactly. So so Tate's response to that as a game plan was to have better timing and to know how, and to exploit the and to exploit Holmes' mistakes when she made them. Holm, because Holm uh, was mostly perfect for this fight. Yeah. Holm made like three mistakes the entire fight, and one of them led to her getting her getting taken down, beat up from top position, getting her back taken, and barely surviving in the second round. She made a mistake when she got nailed with a counter when she got nailed with a with a hard left hook counter in. Uh, I think it was the third or the fourth round that she recovered from just fine and then she made uh, and then she made a mistake in the fifth round when she threw that straight left from too close she made like Those... three noticeable mistakes and tate was on every single one exactly and so but what you have to respect about tate is it's not that she it's not that she just let whole uh, like let home do her thing and then tried to find mistakes she tried to force mistakes and she was prepared to take advantage of those mistakes when they were made. So it's not like she only tried reactive shots when she was at the perfect distance. She tried reactive shots all the time. And finally, she happened to put herself in exactly the right position to capitalize with a reactive shot in the fifth round. It's not that she stopped trying. She never let herself get taken off that game plan based on the fact that she failed. She adjusted, tried something, tried something in the same general theme, but with slight adjustments to try and get herself back in the uh, back in the right spot and to get what she wanted. So damn crafty with that finishing sequence like mm-hmm. just so just determined but skillful i think she twice uh broke home down by pulling back control and by dragging her down on top of her and getting her hooks in couldn't quite get it but maintained that over under and then she went for the hook as home was turtled and while she was fighting for the other hook home was fighting that by getting her hip against the fence and that was when tate went full sakuraba completely forgot about the leg positioning and immediately latched on the choke much like uh rocky pennington did in her fight with um ashley evans smith uh when you just have that position and you think okay i've got to get this now and when you have the choke completely locked in uh, like nate did with his guillotine against mcgregor when you have the choke completely locked in and secured it's going to at the very least force a reaction from the opponent which can then allow you to progress positionally and well, and and even even before that, take it a take it one step back from that. How brilliant was the, the decision to duck around to the rear waist cinch in the first place? Yes, yes, because yes. because what she had noticed earlier on, the last time she had gotten in on a body lock, was that Holm was going to drop her hips down and try to break and try to break the grip or try to uh, try to turn break the grip and then exit off. Yeah, and Holm had successfully done that the last two times Tate had gotten in or gotten close on the body lock. That she noticed that Holm was immediately trying to turn and create uh, turn and create space. So she used Holm's reaction to turn against her turned with her and immediately ducked around to the back. Like that's the Brian Caraway move right there. Sure. That's something that she learned from, I'm sure that she learned from Brian Caraway who is brilliant at taking the back. Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. And, and home herself acknowledged, uh, in the, in the, in the, um, post fight press conference, she was talking about how she should have fought the hands more and the way that Tate, uh, used the waist cinch to transition to the back. And I, for some reason it tickled me that, um, because Misha Tate, is just a pit bull. Uh, when Holm threw her, tried to throw her in her last ditch effort to escape after the choke was cinched in, Tate was so committed to that choke that even though I think she lost both her hooks uh, in that throw, she was so tightly gripping the choke that all the force of being thrown over Holmes' head actually tightened the choke so that when they rolled over again and Misha secured back control and crossed her ankles, you could see that, that Misha's forearm was about two inches further under Holmes' jaw than it was before. Compl- one of the tightest rear naked chokes I think I've ever seen. Just ridiculously tight. And uh, that's why Holm went out throwing a, a punch combo on her back. Well, she was just ridiculously relentless the yeah. whole fight. Like, I mean, it's really easy for us to talk about things like, and, and this has come up in our discussion of Tate, and, and it came up in our discussion of Nate Diaz. It's really easy for us to talk about being cool under pressure and being relentless and sticking with it. But it's a much easier said than done to have the experience, the savvy, the cool under pressure to uh, to take your opponent's shots, to not let yourself get out of the fight, even when things aren't necessarily going your way, and and to come back and find the finish, like. That is a serious accomplishment. It speaks to real 
absolute mental fortitude. Like, Mm -hmm. are you comfortable after having said this, like, despite the fact that Tate was the Tate lost pretty handily up to the point where Ronda Rousey armbarred her, would you be comfortable in saying that Tate couldn't have won that fight had she not gotten armbarred at that point? No, no, I I think she could have, she could have come back because that's Misha Tate. And I'm, I'm quite comfortable. I should say, I'm not comfortable saying Tate could win the third fight between the two, which will most likely happen if Ronda does return to MMA, which is still in doubt. But, um, I'm definitely not comfortable saying Ronda Rousey wins it. I think oh, given I, her mental state and everything, I think it's it's basically a toss-up. And Misha Tate in toss-ups has proven to be just insanely good. I will go on the record right now and say that I am picking Misha Tate in a third fight with Ronda Rousey. I will at least go on the record and say that I did place a small bet on Misha Tate to beat <laughs> Ronda Rousey. I don't know if I'll be able to pick her. I'll have to look at footage and maybe chicken out and talk myself out of it again. But I, I definitely feel that. Like uh, I, You just can't count Misha Tate out of anything. And given the improvements she showed over the first fight to the second fight, who's to say she couldn't show even greater improvements in the third fight? And I think she's grown as a fighter since then. I think the only difficult thing is that... Um, as we mentioned last week, Ronda's going to get her emotionally invested, which Holly Holm did not. Misha was able to fight a completely cool fight because almost always Misha goes in there and fights over aggressively. She takes the Carlos Condit approach where she kind of has to have uh, her adaptations beaten into her a little bit in the beginning. That definitely happened in the second Ronda, both Ronda fights. It happened in the the um, I fight, the McMahon fight, she goes in there, swings away, and then she adjusts. And she didn't do it in the home fight. She was completely cool, cool as a cucumber. But I'm not sure that, once again, with Ronda in there, like, questioning her sincerity and going crazy, if she'll be able to maintain that level of composure again. See, I'm, I think at some point, that's just experience. Like, sure, yeah. So Tate was, the last time Tate fought Rousey, she was a 26-year-old, I think. I think she was 26 years old. She It was her second fight in the UFC. Is she that young? Uh, yeah, she's only – I think she's 28. Is she really? Yeah. No she's been around way. for a long time. She's no got a lot way. of experience. I did not know that. I'm going to look at this right now. Go on. Yeah, I think she was born in 87. So, like, we're talking about somebody who has had a lot of time to grow since then. She's gotten much better training now than she was getting at the time. I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to. I would pick her in that third fight, and I'll tell you what. I think more than anything else, it's her ability to get to the back, which she's shown off in her last few fights, and how much better her top control Ooh, grappling with is. Ronda's head and arm throw. That is a dangerous place to be. That's that's exactly what I'm seeing. If Rousey goes in there. She tries a head and arm throw. Tate Tate scrambles and gets her back. Like we've seen, we've seen Rousey get herself in trouble a few times with that over the years. But but I don't know. I just I trust Tate's coaching i trust tate's uh cool under fire i trust that she has consistently made improvements whereas i don't think that the ronda rousey that we've seen in her last few fights is demonstrably better from a technical or strategic perspective than the one who fought tate and and got her and and who got some licks in in uh in 20 at the end of 2013 oh got some good licks in i think what most of all what we saw from ronda rousey and unfortunately because of the the depth of the women's bantamweight division and the the certain skill gaps of many of her opponents, we weren't able to pick up on this then. But I think what we were really seeing is just a rapidly widening gap between confidence and ability. We were seeing her go in there without having actually improved, but be more confident despite that in each and every performance up until the point at which she was confidently running into Holly Holmes' left hand over and over again. Mm-hmm. I'm with that. So we got a couple of questions to close out the show today. Oh, yeah. Uh, Do you want to – should we play the sound effect? You mean this sound effect, Pat? So, yeah, I'm talking about that sound effect. So, so glad we got to preface that. People might – I think it's just such a good sound effect that people might not be prepared if we don't <laughs> preface it. You know what I mean? I don't want it to catch anybody off guard. They'll be still be driving their car on their commute. They'll crash something. I just want everyone to know you're about to have your mind blown by this amazing sound effect, courtesy of Oxygen Addiction. Thanks for that. Um, we have a couple of questions, two, I believe. Do we want to do our Twitter question first? Yeah, let's go with the Twitter question first. You have that one pulled up. You want to read it? Uh, yeah. So this comes to us from uh, from longtime listener uh, Jimmy Clark at Jimmy Clark with a with an E on the end uh, on Twitter. So how good do you think Makwan Amirkani is or can be? Pretty damn good. Were you impressed with his performance in that Mike Wilkinson fight? 
I was. I think Mike Wilkinson is a pretty underrated fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's he's well rounded. I think he's dangerous. I think he's got a. I think he's got a pretty good wrestling game. I think he's a pretty good boxer. Nice combinations. I don't think he's a guy to be taken lightly. And the fact that he lost so handily against Hani Jason should not blind us to that fact. He just hasn't fought very much. We don't have a good sense for Mike Wilkinson, and he came off a tough season that nobody watched. Uh, but Wilkinson's a good fighter, and the way that Amir Khani beat him, uh, clearly taking uh, pretty cleanly taking two rounds and even uh, getting himself out of trouble when he was in it, like to me that that speaks to how good Amir Khani is. Wilkinson is not a pushover. He's, He's a another gamer. highly touted prospect in Nicholas Backstrom. Like yeah. there's yeah, yeah. there's a lot to like. I would describe Wilkinson as a gamer. He's one of those guys you know he's going to give you a tough fight. You know you know he's going to go in there and give it his all. He's going to be pushing a pace and fighting consistently. So you basically you're going to have a, a, a stiff test on your hands, even if it's a fight that you're supposed to win. And I think that was the case with Amir Khani. I think he had a little bit of difficulty with his stamina near the end of the fight. The fight was going at a pretty blistering pace. And maybe that's because, you know, like a lot of the other people we've discussed today, he's inexperienced. He has had so many blowout performances. But now having had a decision, gotten a decision over a tough, uh, a, a tough young fighter under his belt and looking really solid, he, he was he was really, really keyed in. And, and, and I think it's very risky in this day and age to be a wrestling-focused fighter in MMA, one who needs the takedown to comfortably win a fight. Um, but I think if you're going to be a wrestling-focused fighter, it's best to be focused on your wrestling. Uh, you know what I mean? To, 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 know, to know that your shot is to wrestle. Uh, you've got to be Ben Askren. You've got to be Khabib Nurmagomedov. You've got to be, uh, I don't know, who else is there? A, a, a small example, Jason Saga, who fought this last weekend. You've got to be somebody who is committed to the idea of getting your opponent down and has a lot of creative ways to do so. Yeah, well, and if you're going to be a guy who who has the, the kind of approach that, uh, that Amir Khani does, like, I think it's hard to overstate what a good wrestler Amir Khani actually is. Yeah, he's great. Like, the ability, because we've seen Mike Wilkinson stuff lots of poorly set up takedowns before. Amir Khani was able to shoot on him in open space, somehow get all the way in onto his hips, turn the ang- uh, turn the corner, and finish. Like, that is really, really hard to do against a guy who knows that your shot is coming, mm-hmm. and you shoot without and you shoot without any real setup. Like, it speaks to the drive that he gets into his takedowns, the strength that he has, the minute technical variations necessary to finish there. And then once he gets you there, it's no picnic because unlike a lot of guys, he's willing to let you move under him and scramble. And that's where he's at his most dangerous. He's most dangerous in the transitions. Like, because he's got a great front headlock, he's got great moves to the back. Like, that's a really, really dangerous game to have. And as time goes on, he's going to become a better striker. Like, the the flying knee against Andy Ogle kind of blinded people to the fact that that's not really Amir Khani's game at all. No. He's a big, strong, physical wrestle grappler. Um, and and that's a pretty good base to have to fall back on, even as time goes on and he goes more con- grows more confident in striking. And he starts to fight guys that he can't just wrestle and grapple into oblivion. You know what is his game? Fake, what? fake glove touch to blast double. That's hey, that's not a bad game to have. Like <laughs> Teruto Ishihara was showing off that move uh, just as he did when he fought Mizuto Hirota. He fought uh, Julian Arosa last weekend. Fake glove touch, immediately kicked to the liver. <laughs> Looked a lot better for those guys than it did for Eric Silva. Where, yes, did oh. he try it too? Oh, Eric Silva tried to try to fake glove touch. Ooh, and I didn't catch that. Something off of it. I didn't catch that, and Eric Silva got melted for it. So, <laughs> dude. So yeah, I mean UFC UFC one ninety six, the twilight of the busted prospects. Hey, I picked. Um, I think I picked. Uh, who who destroyed Eric Silva? I'm, trying, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, Nordin Taleb. You did. You picked him by split decision, man. I I, I I did, but I think I also picked him as my best value for my betting pick. If you pick Nordin well, Taleb by KO, you were a lucky person because I'm sure the odds are crazy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we have one more heavy bag question, right? We do. Yeah, we do. This question comes to us from Evan Lee, who very kindly supported Heavy Hands on Patreon, $5 a month back in February. Thank you, Evan. And uh, Evan asks – this is a shower thought, by the way. So uh, <laughs> with this, is, this is from the, the deepest, darkest depths of Evan's mind. Uh, what if you took, Evan asks, a novice and began their punching training by putting them into a static form of the end position of a punch? My reasoning for this is so that they know what the punching position should feel like. They'll notice the weight on the lead leg, the shoulder shrug, the shoulder whirl, etc. You can tell that he's read Jack Dempsey's championship fighting from that terminology. 
The object is for them to be familiar enough with the end position that they're able to use it as a measuring stick to feel when something feels wrong. It seems logical to start with the end position because you'll feel and know what your position should be by knowing how your weight is distributed, which then makes self-correction and error assessment easy. So he's basically saying that as a, as a fundamental uh, step in teaching somebody to throw a punch, you teach them where the punch ends up so that they know they can, they can figure out the dynamic in between parts of the motion for themselves and know where to finish. What do you think of that, Pat? Um, I don't know if I would start with that, but I think that that's a really good idea in terms of teaching punching technique. And I wish somebody had done that with me. Um, like, I I don't know if that's where I would, where, where I would start because I think that as good as it is to know where you end up, you have to feel the process too, because I think there are a lot of mistakes to be made in the process itself. And if you just start at the end, then you're not necessarily going to, I don't think that that necessarily teaches you how to get there. I wish that after a few classes of having somebody just watch me as I threw over and over and over again, um, that somebody would have showed me the end point and said, okay, this is what it's supposed to feel like at the end. Uh, and, and then we just drilled that. Like, uh, so I do think that that has a place, but to me, one of the things that this, that this highlights is the importance of having somebody watch you very closely when you're first starting. I would say. Yeah. And I think everybody is really, really eager to jump into a lot of things and understandably so. And I think you probably started like this and I certainly did. You want to start hitting things because that's why you get into combat sports. It's why you get into martial arts. You want to hit some shit. So it's very difficult to curb that urge to have a watchful eye to teach you movements and balance and things like that before you really start to throw your weight at things is a really valuable thing and a rare thing. Um, and I think for me, I think the the number one thing that I would teach, uh, number one thing that I would have liked to have been taught would be the body mechanics behind a punch first, especially because I think the punching body mechanics are intrinsically linked to head movement body mechanics. And so learning those fundamental movements, the folding of the hips, the distributing of the weight from one foot to the other uh, without letting the head fall forward, the gaining strength in the hips, those kind of things are, are crucial to so many aspects of boxing that I would like to know those things first of all. So then when I start to, to learn where my ending positions are, I know the movement of how to get there. And then I, I think that fixing the ending position, that kind of thing is a one of the things that I think is uh, pad pad work is best suited to somebody holding a power pad or even just working the mitts with you can feel your punch, tell how good the follow through is, how good your snap is, and then correct your position as you connect to make sure you're getting the right amount of each thing. That's one thing I really like about watching Ray Longo work pads is Ray Longo uses a wide variety of tools for different purposes yeah. like that. So he'll use the big power pad uh, when, when he's working on the precise variations of technique for that reason. So like there's a video of him doing that with Aljamain Sterling and Ally Quinta and Chris Weidman. And I think that's part of the reason why when you see his guys throw, they do so with, with such clean mechanics. Yeah, and it's one of those things where you can just line up four guys – and have them just cycle through, each of them throw a lead right and run to the back of the line, and they can just run through that mechanic over and over and over again and get it locked in. And you can stand there, power pad to your chest or body pad or something, and feel how good their weight transfer is and see their arm as it and make sure it's not locking out too much and make sure that it's relaxed and everything. Yeah, um, It's an interesting idea. I think ending position should be focused on a lot more. I think there's a lot of small things. Fist formation? Nobody teaches fist formation in boxing gyms anymore. Why is that? And only people who know how to punch with a proper fist are karate people. I don't get it. Uh, That's too much reliance on hand wraps and, uh, and gloves. On hand wraps and yeah, gloves. Yeah, you yeah. and I were talking about this a while back, but like, I I think as long as you know how to make a fist right, and I think I do because a lot of the guys I started doing Muay Thai with had come from a karate background. Yeah, like yep. you don't like you can work a bag without without like big sixteen ounce gloves on. I, I wear have to have that. I wear old school bag mitts that are basically just quilted leather. Uh, and I love it. I love it. And people freak out about this. If you go into like the the gear review section of Sure Dog or something like that, and you're like, I want these small gloves, or I hit the bag with just wraps, people lose their shit because there is this conception that you need you need to protect your hands. But one of the best ways to protect your hands in the long run is to learn how to use them properly. And the only way to do that is to um, get used to hitting without uh, heavy protection. I think so. 
So anyway, a wide variety of topics to help you enjoy that answer, Evan. Hope we gave you enough depth there. It's a very interesting idea. I would encourage you to continue to explore it, but make sure you pay attention to all the aspects of punching mechanics so you can get the whole motion down pat. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for tuning in today, listening to today's episode. We hope that you, you, you caught some of our infectious enthusiasm. It was such a fantastic topic to discuss. What an amazing upset in both of those fights. Um, before we wrap up, let's see where you can find us. I am at Boxing Bush on Twitter. Pat you are at Patrick underscore Wyman. You can find more Heavy Hands episodes on heavyhandspodcast.com. New episodes every Wednesday on Bloody Elbow. Uh, very quickly, Pat, anything coming out this week? Uh, I already had a little post-fight analysis piece come up. This is aimed at the aimed at the more casual reader. Just a few big takeaways from the from the upsets of uh, of Misha Tate and Nate Diaz. And then later this week, I will have a piece coming out with uh, uh, with my colleague Stephen Rondina on uh, on how Conor McGregor needs to needs to fix his game if he uh, moving forward. Interesting. Um, I had a, a breakdown. That sounded really patronizing, by the way. I really think that sounded interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, no. Like yeah. So it, just a just a brief little look at the topic. No, it sounds interesting. It, for some reason, oh, as I soon as I, I sound patronizing. No, no, no. Me, I said interesting. It sounded like I was completely <laughs> blowing you off. I, I I am interested in that. Um, I can't sound sincere for some reason. Uh, and for as for me, I had a piece come out on Nate Diaz's win, a uh, pretty epic breakdown around 2,200 words or something like that called uh, Defying the Storm, How Nate Diaz Beat Conor McGregor at UFC 196. Very proud of it. I think it turned out really well. I encourage you to check it out. It doesn't cover all the breadth of things that we discussed today, but it goes into a great deal of depth with a lot of the small things. And I try to get into the fighters' mentalities later this week. Uh, I've got something in the works with Phil McKenzie organizing the lightweight division that should be coming out soon or the women's bantamweight division as well. But I it may be a follow up to the puncher's path because that's been reposted a few times. People have been commenting on it. It was way back in January of 2015 when I posted that before Connor's fight with Dennis Seaver. And uh, I think it's a it's a little appropriate to comment on it and see where I went wrong and what I got right when I made that prediction. So I think I'll try to revisit that if I have the time. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining us once again. We hope you enjoyed today's show. If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands.